Good morning. I was warned. <laughs> Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego. My name is Suzelle Lynch, and my pronouns are she, her, and Aya. I am so glad to be here with you as your minister in residence through the end of June. With me, leading the service today, is my amazing and beloved colleague, Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhardt. Our community is a vital, diverse, and multi-generational congregation without borders, with a mission to create community, nurture spiritual growth, and act on our values to help heal the world. Muy buenos días. Les doy la bienvenida al servicio de la Primera Iglesia Unitaria Universalista de San Diego. Mi nombre es Omega Burkhardt y uso los pronombres de she, they y ella en español. Me acompaña en la dirección del servicio hoy mi querida colega, la Reverend Suzelle Lynch, <laughs> quien estará con nosotros hasta fines de junio. Nuestra comunidad es una congregación vital, diversa, multigeneracional y sin fronteras, cuya misión es crear comunidad, fomentar el crecimiento espiritual y vivir nuestros valores para ayudar a sanar el mundo. We are a congregation made up of people of different racialized identities and cultures, people of various sexual orientations and gender identities, people with a variety of physical and mental abilities. We are creators of community and compassion, and though we can fall short, we're committed to practicing and affirming welcome to all. Somos una congregación compuesta de personas de distintas identidades, identidades racializadas y culturas, personas de diversas orientaciones sexuales e identidades de género, personas de varias habilidades mentales y físicas. Somos creadores de comunidad y compasión. Y aunque a veces nos quedamos cortos, estamos comprometidos a dar la bienvenida a todos. As we prepare to enter worship together this morning, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Como manera de entrar juntos en el espíritu de la experiencia sagrada, tenemos algunos anuncios generales. The First Unitarian Universalist Church is one congregation with two campuses, one in Hillcrest and one in Chula Vista in the South Bay. Right now, due to the pandemic, we are meeting only at the Hillcrest campus, but we have two online social hour groups after the service. To access our social hour at 11 o'clock for both of our campuses, you can find the link in the comments or the order of service or on our webpage. Make sure you use the password, which is today's date, 04-10-2022. We are also very, very pleased today to introduce to you our new kitchen manager, Tiger Moses is with us. Fantastic. Yes, let's give a round of applause for that. Tiger has set up our first in-person coffee hour today. If you are joining us here in person on the Hillcrest campus, please welcome Tiger during coffee hour. It will be right here on the west side of Bard Hall, right around the corner the rounded corner, right around the rounded corner. <laughs> La Primera Iglesia Unitaria de San Diego es una congregación de dos campuses, en Hillcrest, donde tenemos servicios ahora debido a la pandemia, y en Chula Vista, en el South Bay. Hay dos posibilidades de reunirse socialmente en línea después del servicio. Para, para, entrar, la hora, eh, para entrar la hora social a las 11, Para nuestros, nuestras dos comunidades, busquen el enlace en los comentarios o en el orden de servicio o en nuestro website. Usen la palabra clave 04-10-20-22, que es la fecha de hoy. Ahí los esperamos. También tenemos el placer hoy de presentarles a Tiger Moses, la nueva manager de cocina de Hillcrest Campus. Y si les interesa darle la bienvenida a Tiger después del servicio, tendremos una hora social con café por primera vez aquí directamente después del servicio, aquí al lado de Bart Hall. Nuestra congregación también participará en una lectura común de Widening the Circle of Concern, 
si quieres saber más de cómo aspiramos a ser más justos y cómo extendemos la bienvenida radical. O si quiere participar, comuníquese con Rosalba Kiempi, otro miembro del equipo de Journey Towards Wholeness. Our congregation will be participating in a reading, a common read in the region, of widening the circle of concern. If you're curious about how to live into our aspirations of racial justice and radical welcome, please contact Rosalba Kiempi or one of the other members of Journey Towards Wholeness. Please watch for more details this coming week. And today, this morning, I'd like to invite you to participate in a different way in our generosity offering. This month and next month, our generosity offering will benefit the Environmental Health Coalition. One of EHC's current campaigns is to improve public transit here in San Diego in the region as well. As part of the San Diego Transit Equity Working Group, the EHC is collecting signatures in support of a half-cent sales tax increase, which would fund transformational improvements in our region's transit. Several people in our congregation are collecting signatures, and you can sign up after the service. Or, if you'd like to have a larger impact, you can take home a petition and collect signatures during the week yourself. Please see Steve Gelb or Armin or Rhea Kuhlman after the service today to take action. Durante los meses de abril y mayo, nuestra ofrenda de generosidad se destinará a Environmental Health Coalition. Una de las campañas ahora es mejorar el sistema de transporte público aquí en la región. Como parte de San Diego Transit Equity Working Group, coleccionamos firmas para apoyar un aumento de medio centavo para impuestos de venta para mejorar los servicios regionales. Si quiere firmar, favor a buscar a Steve Gelb o Armin o Rea Kuhlman después del servicio. También, si quiere, puede buscar firmas en su propia petición durante la semana, si quiere. Muchas gracias. Y, como siempre, si desea platicar con uno de nuestros pastores voluntarios entrenados después del servicio, llevan hoy estolas muy coloradas y estarán sentados aquí cerca del fuente de agua. Muchas gracias, como siempre, por la atención a los anuncios importantes de nuestra comunidad. If you'd like to speak to one of our trained lay ministers after the service, they'll be wearing an identifying colorful scarf and they will be seated by the fountain. Are our lay ministers here? Not quite yet. They'll be wearing a colorful scarf seated over here. Of course, thank you as always for your attention to these important announcements from our community.
In a spirit of reverence, we acknowledge that we gather this morning to sing, reflect, learn, and converse on the stolen land of the Kumie, who, Kumeyaay, who continue to pray, sing, gather, and live throughout their territories. As we journey together, may we hold the Kumeyaay in our hearts and minds. Con espíritu de reverencia, reconocemos que nos juntamos esta mañana para meditar y conversar en la tierra arrebatada de los Kumeyaay, quienes continúan reuniéndose, cantando, orando y viviendo en todo su territorio. Al emprender este viaje juntos, mantengamos en nuestros corazones y mentes el pueblo Kumeyaay. And now let us join our spirits in our church hymn and recite our church aspiration. the spirit of this church. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. Que el amor sea la doctrina de esta iglesia, la búsqueda de la verdad, su sacramento, y el servicio, su oración. Vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad con libertad y ayudarnos mutuamente en comunidad. A eso aspiramos. As is our custom in the South Bay Chula Vista worship gatherings, you're invited to rise now in body or in spirit and greet those around you. If you are at home or online, greet the people you're with and say hi in the chat box on YouTube, or just grab your phone and text a friend or family member. Good morning, everybody. If you're already standing, we invite you to stay aloft in body or in spirit.
for our hymn, 1003, Where Do We Come From? Good morning. My name is Tony, and I use he, him pronouns. And I was so caught up in being able to sing and around that I almost missed my cue. That was awesome. <laughs> so today, we're thinking about the stories we tell and how they shape and change who we are. That could mean the actual stories we tell and books we read, but it could also mean the movies we watch, the stories we encounter in the news, or the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves on social media. It might even include the stories about ourselves, those, those beliefs that we believe about ourselves in the world that we can sometimes believe without even knowing it. So our story today is about a young girl who sees how some of those messages are presented to her by the media, her family, and the world in general. And she decides to rewrite the story to claim the authorship of her life for herself. In this week, when Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson was confirmed as the first African American woman on the Supreme Court, I think this story is particularly appropriate for today. So let's take a look and listen. Ambitious Girl by Mina Harris illustrated by Marissa Valdez. Too assertive, too persistent, too loud, too confident, too ambitious, too proud. Don't let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. When I grow up, 
I hope to be all the things I can see in a world that's changing fast and slow, a world I'm only beginning to know. I want to go, go, go out the gate, but sometimes all I hear is wait. And if I try to resist, it's you're to that or you're to this. Those words may try to dim my light, but mommy says that words passed down can build me up to new heights. Standing tall like a soaring tower, I am valued, I am loved, I have purpose, hope, and power. Ahead of me, sisters, aunties, mothers have opened so many doors. Grandma says, you may be the first someday, but don't be the last, make space for more. No one can tell me who I am or who I'm meant to be. Auntie says, what has always been is all they're able to see. I'll take my time and claim my place and show this world this is me. Persistent means I won't give up. Assertive means I won't back down. Confident means I believe in me. Proud means I cheer for us the world around. Ambitious means all of that and more. I have goals, but I'm not keeping score. Ambitious girls, we get things done. If life's a race, we're ready to run. If we fall, we get back up. And if we fail, it's a chance to disrupt. No to that or to this will stop what's inside us from flowering. From now on, when I hear to that or to this, I won't mind. It's empowering. I'll take up space. I'll shout if I please. I'll laugh and I'll play and I'll jump at the sun. I'll wear the words thrown at me and I won't take no from anyone. I'm not afraid to make some noise. I am more than ready to use my voice. Because there's no to that or to this when it comes to being ambitious. The end. I hope you enjoyed the story. Maybe you'll take some time this week to think about the messages you're told by society, as well as what messages you're sending with the stories you believe about yourself and the world. What parts of those stories do you like? What parts would you want to change? And what parts have been in need of revision for far too long? And now, please join me as we say our affirmation, those words that tell the story of who we are and who we want to be. We'll say it first in Spanish and then in English. Somos unitarios universalistas, personas de mentes abiertas, corazones amarosos y manos que dan la bienvenida. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. And I invite all the children and youth to meet myself and your leaders at the foot of the ramp for religious education. La ofrenda de generosidad este mes y también en el mes de mayo se destinará a Environmental Health Coalition de National City, cuya misión es la afirmación de la justicia ambiental con intento de eliminar el racismo basado en policías que causan peligros ambientales a las personas de bajos ingresos y personas de color. Es nuestra misión aquí en la Primera Iglesia Unitaria Universalista de San Diego tomar la iniciativa de las organizaciones comunitarias para aprender cómo podemos ser útiles. Durante este mes esperamos asociarnos con Environmental Health Coalition a través de nuestra ofrenda de generosidad, servicios calificados y tiempo voluntario. This month's generosity offering will go to the Environmental Health Coalition based right here in National City. Their mission is the affirmation of environmental justice with the goal of eliminating racism based on policies that cause environmental hazards to low-income populations and people of color. 
since this is our mission here at First UU San Diego, to take the lead from community organizations in learning how we can be of service. Over the course of the next two months, we look forward to partnering with the Environmental Health Coalition through our generosity offering, through skilled services, and also through our volunteer time. Puede donar en el sitio web de nuestra iglesia, firstuusandiego.org, donations. También puede donar aquí con efectivo, cheque o tarjeta, usando las cestas o frascos que están ahí en la mesa en el patio. Para donaciones con cheque, cheque por favor, indica ofrenda de generosidad. Después del video corto, en un momento, y durante la música, siéntanse libres de acercarse a la mesa de ofrenda. Y gracias, como siempre, por su generosidad. You may donate by using the baskets or the dip jars on the patio, on the table. It has moved just a little bit to make way for coffee hour. You may also donate online on our church's website, firstuusandiego.org slash donations. And when donating by check, please designate a generosity offering. After the short video and during the music, please feel free to rise in body or spirit if you'd like and go to the offering table on your phone if you would prefer to stay seated. Thank you for your generosity. And I was born and raised in Logan Heights in San Diego. We do have a lot of pollution and there's many factors that add to that pollution and it affects the health of our, of our neighborhood. Growing up I had a lot of schoolmates that had asthma or other health complications. My mom had to have a couple surgeries from her respiratory issues and now with medical bills as well. I think the solution is to require the buses to be totally electric and for them to be ran 24-7.
Thank you very much for your generosity. As we prepare for a time of meditation and reflection, I want to let you know that early next week, some of our leaders and I will meet with other Southern California UU clergy and lay leaders to discern how we can best support our Ukrainian friends and neighbors who are coming across the border or waiting there for help. So with that in mind, let us join our hearts and minds now in the spirit of meditation with words adapted from a prayer written by our colleague, the Reverend Eric Cherry. Spirit of life and love, spirit breathing in us and through us and all around us, reaching out from each one of us to touch all of the people who are here with us now and reaching out wider still to touch all living things across our beautiful planet Earth. Spirit of life, though each of us carries burdens and sorrows of our own, we hear you calling us today, calling us to embody equity and freedom. We feel your presence in every struggle to overcome oppression, to overcome violence, and today we know you again deeply in our desire to offer solidarity and support to our siblings in Ukraine, the citizens and the fighters and the leaders and all those who have fled the violence of their home places, their beloved cities and towns. Help us draw near to them in our hearts, those who are half a world away from us and those who are close, oh, so close, waiting, hoping, longing for shelter and safety. Spirit of love, be with all who are suffering so terribly from the violence in Ukraine. Lift up the hearts of those who fear. Be present with political leaders, inspire courage among those who would make peace. Guide the hands of all those who are caring for the injured, the hungry, and the grieving, and open us up. Lead us toward generous engagement. Spirit of life and love, we honor these and the longings of our own hearts now for just a moment in shared silence. Spirit of, spirit of life and love, spirit of life and love. We feel your presence in every struggle to overcome pain and fear and oppression. And may we know, as we feel that presence, may we know that we are loved, we are whole, and we are not alone. Shalom, blessed be, Ashe and K Asi Sia. Our first reading this morning.
comes from the book Braiding Sweetgrass, written by Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a scientist, a plant ecologist, and a member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. Dr. Kimmerer graces, graceless, graciously invites the sharing of stories from her book. We share this story today with care and respect for the people to whom it belongs. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, and through it she fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. This was adapted from the oral tradition in Shenandoah and George from 1988. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below, but in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at that sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. Sky Woman felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Sky Woman saw them all gather, loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far. One by one, the other animals offered to help otter, beaver, sturgeon in the depth. The darkness and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned, gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs failed, flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human. I'm going to pause for one moment. We understand that there may be someone in danger right now, and so we'll hold a moment of silence for them. Thank you. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing their worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human. But then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. A turtle said, here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. 
The land grew and grew, and as she danced her thanks from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not made by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animal's gifts coupled with her deep gratitude. Together they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, or home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were branches, fruits, and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees, and medicines spread everywhere. And now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on Turtle Island. Dr. Kimmerer notes, the story of Sky Woman's journey is so rich and glittering, it feels to me like a deep bowl of celestial blue from which I could drink again and again. It holds our beliefs, our history, our relationships. Images of Sky Woman speak not just of where we come from, but also of how we can go forward. Children hearing the Sky Woman story from birth know in their bones the responsibility that flows between humans and the earth. How I love that story. Our second reading is a little different. This one comes from an article called Systemic Racism 401, The Myth of Meritocracy, by a man named Reggie Jackson, who's from Milwaukee, which is where I come to you from, which was published in the Milwaukee Independent online newspaper. Reggie Jackson writes, a well-known proverb tells us that to the victor go the spoils. Simply put, the winners get to tell what happened. In America, the winners have nearly always been those we call white. White people have told themselves and the world a version of the American story which appears to justify the current state of affairs. For, most part, for the most part, this version of the story, this history we all learn, tells the story of meritocracy in America. Those who have had success are assumed to have earned it. We spend years being taught about the elites and famous people of American society in school. The rough lives of average people rarely make it into our history textbooks. Patriotism is one of the aims of our education. If we learn about the triumphs of America, we learn to love our country. In 1983, Philip Curtin, former American Historical Association president wrote, in the 19th century and too far into the 20th, history was consciously one-sided. It was not supposed to be even-handed, but designed instead to promote patriotism and glorify the nation. These tendencies reached a kind of apogee with the overblown patriotic fervor of the First World War. Reggie Jackson continues, there's an opposite side of the coin we must examine how the American caste system has prevented some from gaining the tools necessary to access the merits of society. We must tell that story as well. And here end the readings. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. This song is called Courage. It was written by Bob Blue. Esta canción se llama Coraje y fue escrita por Bob Blue. A small thing, one. 
once happened at school that brought up a question for me. And somehow it taught me to see the price that I paid to be cool. Diane is a girl that I know. She's strange like she doesn't belong. I don't mean to say that that's wrong. We don't like to be with her, though. And so when we all made a plan to have this big party at Sue's, most kids at the school got the news. No one invited Diane. The thing about Taft Junior High, the secrets don't last very long. I acted like nothing was wrong when I saw Diane start to cry. I know you may think that I'm cruel, it doesn't make me very proud. I just went along with the crowd. It's sad, but you have to at school. You can't pick the friends you prefer. You fit in as well as you can. I couldn't be friends with Diane. Cause then they would treat me like her In one class at Taft Junior High We study what people have done With gas chamber, bomber and gun At Auschwitz, Japan and Milai I don't understand all I learned Sometimes I just sit there and cry The whole world stood idly by And watched as the innocent burned Like robots obeying some rule Atrocities done by the mob All innocent doing their job what was it for? Was it cool? The world was aware of this hell And how many cried out in shame What heroes and who was to blame? A secret that no one dared tell I promise to do what I can to not let it happen again To share all the love that I can I'll start by inviting Thank you, Marshall. That was lovely. So before I launch in to my um, homily, I just want to say that this is a powerful time of year for stories in the world of religion. It's Palm Sunday, powerful story there in the Christian tradition. Passover, such powerful stories. And also it's Ramadan. So more stories there. We hold all of our religious neighbors and their stories with us today. So have you heard any good stories lately? No? OK, I got some for you. Well, actually, we just heard a great story from Tony, Ambitious Girl. Such a great message, too. But I'm here to say we all have stories. Stories to tell, stories that have been told about us, 
stories we've heard from the people in our lives and stories, as Tony alluded to, that we've absorbed from the institutions and cultures surrounding us. Muriel Ruckheiser, known for her powerful poems on feminism, social justice, and Judaism said, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. Stories, she means, go deeper than the words they're made of. Like music, they're a way of thinking and feeling that helps us live more consciously and fully. Stories shine a light, like a flashlight, like a laser beam on the interconnections of life and history, art and purpose. It's as Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen says, there's a powerful saying, sometimes we need a story more than food. Stories tell us who we are, what's possible for us, and what we might call upon. They remind us that we're not alone with whatever faces us. So I'd like to tell you a story now that comes from a guy named Josh Gowan. He writes, in high school, a teammate on my track team told me about the big oak tree in his backyard when he was growing up. Did you have a tree like that in your yard? Maybe not an oak here in California. One day, his older brother climbed way up into the branches of this tree and then called him over to, called him over. Happy that his big brother wanted to include him in the tree climbing activity, the little brother ran over as quickly as he could and as he gazed up with an eager smile, his brother peed down on him from high above. Gowan said he too couldn't help but laugh at the story, but he wasn't really laughing at his teammate's misfortune. He wrote, actually, the thought of him standing there wide-eyed and then suddenly realizing he'd been terribly tricked reminded me of a similar incident in my own life. In the years that passed, Gowan and his teammate became best friends. He says, I suspect that the story he shared along with similar ones I told him, had a lot to do with that. Gowan reminds us that hearing each other's stories builds empathy, and that empathy helps us grow deep relationships. Incidentally, Gowan happens to be a behavioral neuroscientist, and his experience with his teammate lines up with neuroscience research. A study conducted at Princeton compared MRI scans of the brain of a person telling a story with MRI scans taken of the brains of the people who were listening to the story. And what happened is that the same parts of the brain lighted up in exactly the same way in both the storyteller and the story listeners. The empathy we feel when hearing another's story is measurable. So stories like the one Gowan's friend told are what I think of as signature stories. Signature stories are ones that have a shaping effect on our lives because they get told over and over again. So think for a moment. What are the stories that you or your family or friends keep telling? Is there a story about yourself that you repeat again and again? Now, sometimes these stories are about our accomplishments, right? And sometimes they're stories of turning points in our lives. For example, pretty much every UU minister I know has a story about hearing the call to ministry. And we love to tell those stories, but I will not tell you mine. <laughs> but all too often, those signature stories that are told and retold are about god-awful things we did when we were kids. People think these stories are funny, but they hurt. And even the ones that seem positive can serve to control us, or trivialize us, or limit us. Do you ever think this happens with the stories we tell about our church? It does, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. Right now, I just want to say something about what I mean by the stories we come from, 
the, the title of this homily. It's sort of like our stories are the planks and bricks that make up the house we live in. We emerge from this nest of stories each day into our present world. Or perhaps stories are the threads of a woven shawl we've worn for so long we hardly feel its weight or warmth on our shoulders anymore. Or maybe our stories are the strapping that weaves the springy surface of a trampoline. We bounce around a bit and then our stories launch us, whee, into the world. Whichever image works best for you, or you probably have one of your own, the truth is, is that stories shape the lens through which we see the world, and they guide the actions we take. Every moment, every day, we come from our stories. So clearly, some of the stories we come from are culture-based, centered in our unique racial, ethnic, and religious heritages. Some of us are descended from the original inhabitants of this land, the indigenous peoples. Some of us are first generation immigrants and others of us carry the bloodlines of those immigrants. Some of us are descendants of enslaved peoples who were brought forcibly to the Americas. And some of us are a mixture of these. I am descended in part from Finnish immigrants who made their way to Michigan's Upper Peninsula in the early 1900s. Jaco and Sanakaisa Vertinen were my great-grandparents. I was named for Sanakaisa, whose English name is Susanna Catherine. She was a stern-faced woman, a hard-working dairy farmer, who, when angered, would mutter, Satana, Satana, too hot Satana which, doesn't it sound terrible? Which is devils, devils, a thousand devils. My mother said it was the scariest thing she'd ever heard. Yako and Sanakaisa's story isn't an extraordinary one. Like so many immigrants who came to this country at the time they did, and like so many who are coming now, they were fleeing political unrest and oppression. In an odd parallel, to some of the immigrants, some of those who are seeking to come to this nation now, not all, the oppressors of Yako and Sanakaisa were the Russians who occupied and controlled Finland for a very long time. So Yako came over here by himself in 1906. A bit like Sky Woman in the reading from Robin Wall Kimmerer, he arrived in this country with little more than hope in his pockets. But also like Sky Woman, he wasn't empty handed. Like her, he clutched a bundle of gifts as he fell, as he traveled. And the gifts he clutched were his skills, his stories, and his willingness to risk living in a place where all the local establishments posted signs that read, no dogs or fins allowed. What Yako didn't know when he came was that it would be, Sanakaisa wouldn't be able to get out of Finland for another 10 years. And by then, only their youngest child, my grandmother, would emigrate with her. They had to leave their two older children behind. I feel their story in my body. Oppression, political struggles, poverty, flight, the ache of long separation. It informs my longing for community and my longing to help those Ukrainian refugees. In the stalwart determination and hopeful faces of those at the border, Ukrainians and more, I see my people. Have you inherited a story like this? Have you considered the ways in which you come from the stories of your ancestors? You know, there's another kind of immigration story we Unitarian Universalists tend to tell about ourselves. It's that story of how we found this UU congregation. About the religious background we came from, including those of us who have no formal background at all. 
How did those stories shape our engagement with our congregation? How do they shape the congregation itself? So the first church I served was in the Seattle, Washington area, and about 60% of the members there were former Protestant Christians. 10% um, were Catholics, former Catholics. 10% were people of Jewish heritage. 10% were raised UU, which is what I am. And there were smaller groups of folks who were unchurched or who were earth-based religious folks. By contrast, in the church I just retired from in Wisconsin, the vast majority of members were raised Catholic. I got there and I thought, uh-oh, I am out of my depth. I, I know Protestants, but I have a lot to learn about my Catholic, my people who are coming from that beautiful Catholic background. So these two congregations had some very different expectations and attitudes about worship services, financial giving, about clergy, and about how we would use the building. That was one of my first lessons in how the stories we come from show up in the shape of our churches. Think about that. So Reggie Jackson reminds us, his article, Systemic Racism 401, reminds us that we also come from collective stories. Reggie is a pretty awesome dude. He's a powerful scholar, educator, and consultant on race relationships. He helps individuals and institutions understand the history of our nation's racial hierarchy and its impact on our lives today. I know Reggie, he is in Milwaukee, and he worked with a group of UU congregations there, including the one that I served. So meritocracy, we know that's a system in which people are said to succeed because of their ability. They get ahead because they perform well, not because they had a head start due to wealth or whiteness, heterosexuality, maleness, or being non-disabled or neurotypical. In America, we get soaked in this myth of meritocracy from the time we are born the idea that those who get ahead deserve it. And it's accompanied by this lie that anybody can be like those people if they just work hard enough. In the article I quoted earlier, Reggie Jackson also writes, many of the privileges of belonging to the group we know as white came to millions of immigrants from Europe, but not necessarily right away. They arrived as Germans, Finns, Poles, Italians, Greeks, Irish and other ethnicities, but eventually they all became successfully, they all successfully became white. He continues, those of African heritage, Native Americans, immigrants from throughout Asia, as well as Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and others who came to be known as Hispanics or Latinos did not have the benefit of joining this exclusive white club, even if their skin was white. As a result, they could not easily gain all of the advantages of America. It's also true, he says, that America bestows merit and privilege to certain classes of whites more than others. It's the old money families, the ones who still attend the exclusive boarding schools, the best Ivy League universities, who continue to see their wealth and influence grow. So we know this stuff, right? Nod if you know this stuff. Yeah. But the myth of meritocracy persists. It follows us everywhere like a loyal shadow on a sunny day. Do you remember the first time you shook yourself loose from this myth? Can you shake yourself loose from it right now? Shake with me. OK, thank you. We need it to keep warm. So folks used to call that shaking ourselves loose moment getting woke, consciously disengaging ourselves from this myth and others that hold that sticky webworks of systemic racism and white supremacy culture is good. Getting woke is good, but you know, it's momentary. To really shift our culture, we have to Pursue anti-racism work like a spiritual practice. Give it the same devotion and reverence we give to our meditation or yoga practices. 
It's the work of a lifetime to dismantle the old systems and build up, build out the beloved community of true equity that we dream is possible. Like getting woke, uncovering, understanding, and owning the stories we come from can be the beginning of transformation. So I want to tell you one of those stories that my family told and retold. Here's how it goes. One Sunday, as we were driving to our UU church, mom and dad in the front seat, kids squashed into the back, a dog jumped out in front of our car. My dad stomped on the brakes and we squealed to a halt and the dog was unharmed. Goodness, my dad exclaimed. I'm so glad I didn't hit him. Everyone was silent for a moment. And then little me, little Susie in the back seat, piped up. I'm glad too, Daddy because then we would have squashed a dog all over the tires. Right? Shocked silence in the car. And then my parents launched in, how could you say such a thing? Did I think that was funny? As we continued driving to church, my sisters began to tease me mercilessly. I was mortified and quite ashamed. So that was bad enough, but I cannot tell you how many times I have heard that story over the years. <laughs> Dozens of times, hundreds of times. My sisters just kept telling it over and over, even after I told them it hurt. And I never wanted to hear it again. But over time, as I grew in self-compassion, I started to see this story differently. What was really happening for little Susie in the back seat at that moment? Well, the back story is that when I was a little girl, I, our neighbors had this huge German shepherd who barked and barked at me when I walked by on my way to school. He scared me so much that sometimes I ran back home Little Susie, in the back seat of the car on the way to church, was simply imagining a way to defeat scary dogs. Squash them with the car. Yeah. Now that's a story I could own. Not about squashing dogs. But the story that I wasn't a little stinker. I was just a scared little girl trying to find a way to protect herself. And the story lost its power to hurt. We all come from so many stories. Stories we've heard, stories that can tell us who we are, what is possible for us, and what we might call upon in good times and hard times. In my former congregation, we used to say that each and every person's story was welcome, along with their gifts and their needs. We said that each person added to the beauty and the power of the church, and that each of us had a role in shaping the church. We said this because we desperately wanted it to be true. I think most of us Unitarian Universalists want that to be true but we knew darn well it wasn't true. We knew that certain stories, certain gifts and needs were somehow a little more welcome than others. We knew that there were some stories we just didn't have room for because we had not yet dismantled the structures of systemic racism and white supremacy culture enough yet to make room for people and stories that might shake us up and change who we were comfortable being. But that congregation that I come from continues to work on it. And I know, even from just being with you all for a week, that you are doing the same. So a bit earlier, I asked you if you thought that some of the stories tell, people tell about your church or its members have been stories that are used to control or limit or trivialize, stories that hurt you as a congregation. 
What I need you to know is that this happens in every human institution. We humans are complex creatures who sometimes unconsciously believe we need sameness to survive. We believe that, unconsciously, we believe that change will threaten everything we love. But in truth, it's the opposite. To survive, we have to grow, and growth never happens without change. And so, let's begin with the self-compassion that empowers us to own our own stories and transform them. Let's tell each other our stories and listen deeply to each other. Here at First UU San Diego, I know that your listening circles have given you a powerful start in that work. But please, let's keep going. Will you tell someone one of your stories today? The very purpose of a story, after all, is to be told, to be shared, and to connect us to one another. Shalom, blessed be, ashe, ike asi seha. And now I invite you to rise in body or in spirit with a beautiful song about self-compassion. There's a river flowing in my soul. We're gonna sing the first verse again at the end, so we'll go through four times. There's a river flowing in my soul. For the gifts we are given this day, for the beauty of our presence together here and online, for all that lives and breathes with such hope and promise, may we be grateful. And as we go forth, may it be with joy. Shalom, blessed be, ashe, i keasi siye. Yeah.